Uh, hi, uh, my name is Da Woon Jung. I'm from the Korea Aerospace Research Institute, CARI. I'll be giving you a talk, not about any of the payloads on, K on KPLO Danui, because I'm, I'm not part of any payload team. I'm actually part of the attitude control team. Uh, we, uh, as you can see, we can get a lot of data, a lot of interesting data out of uh, Danuri. So, so uh, briefly, uh, Mark Robinson gave it gave a very nice overview. So, uh, basically, this is the mission launched on August fourth. Uh, recently finished commissioning. Uh, it was likely to be an extended mission. Uh, so this is the route that Danuri took to the moon, very long route. Uh, it's the first flight uh, from the Luti camera. Uh, a very nice Earthrise image and one of the simulations that I did to match it. So uh, KPOS 5 science is uh, not including the DTN payload. That's a technology demonstration. Uh, none of the results are widely available yet. Uh, probably a lot of them are under embargo. But KPL does generate a lot of telemetry, housekeeping telemetry, uh, attitude control telemetry. So this provides a lot of insight into the spacecraft dynamics and also the surrounding environment. Uh, so this is kind of a lot of engineering stuff, but as you can see, it will lead to uh, some science. So, KPLA spacecraft uh, is controlled by is controlled by reaction wheels, but we do get a lot of momentum building from there because of, there's a significant amount of external disturbance torque. So these tend to shake the spacecraft very minutely, but over the course of many orbits, it tends to build up. Uh, and there's another thing that we we don't quite we, we know the inertial parameters. You know, the inertial parameters are a moment of inertia of any solid object. Uh, we, we, knew, we measure them at the time of launch, before launch, but we don't quite know them exactly at the moment. So can you know any of these? Can you measure any of them? Well, so I went about and did that. Uh, it's just a uh, rigid body dynamics. So the main sources of disturbances that shake the spacecraft and lunar orbit are there's a solar array, solar array drive assembly. The spacecraft has two uh, wings, solar array wings, on uh, symmetrically mounted. These generate a significant amount of disturbance torques because there's stepper motors in here. Uh, and also there's a gravity gradient that, that's caused by uh, imperfectly centered uh, center of gravity on the spacecraft, a little bit off, but in turn the, gra the gravity Pulls on the spacecraft, creating a torque. Uh, a little bit smaller than that is solar radiation pressure caused by uh, photons from the sun and also photons from the moon, which is lunar radiation pressure. And even smaller than that is uh, gravity terms that are caused by, in, by uh, well, as you, as you know, the moon has a very imbalanced uh, gravitational field. Uh, there's also an, an antenna that moves on the spacecraft normally, but for this study, it was the antenna thankfully stayed still. So we use an incentive common filter to figure out the moment of inertia. Uh, fortunately, there was some there was a, a lot of data, so we found some data where, where it can make uh, the filter observable. Uh, unfortunately, the telemetry interval is very coarse. One, per, one hertz, and some of it is even worse, like uh, 0.25 hertz or 0.1625. So we had to do a little bit of interpolation. Uh, well, this is basically just an incentive common filter. So uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the, the major sources of uh, disturbance. So the solar radiation pressure, which is caused by photons uh, impinging on the spacecraft, uh, mainly the well, all the, well, we treated the spacecraft as a plate model. Uh, this is a this is a this is a very standard equation that we use. 
Uh, we also modeled the lunar radiation pressure. So we took a we modeled the moon as a kind of a plate model uh, using the LRO diviner uh, temperature data. So the the hot areas are are they look hot? They are red. And in this particular data, we have the spacecraft orbiting, starting to orbit above the hot part, and then going back behind the, the cold part, which is the shattered part. Uh, we also assume a gravity model at first, but as you'll see, as I'll explain later, uh, our data can show that the, this gravity model is, it, it, it's kind of absorbing the gravity model as well. So for this study, we assumed the GRAIL uh, 1200A model. Uh, I know there's a more recent one, but uh, so up to order 10 only because MATLAB gets really, really slow if you do any more than that. Uh, so this is the range of uh, telemetry data that we use. Uh, it's from February 14th of this year. Uh, about two lunar orbits, starting from the far side, and then one orbit, two orbits later, ending on the near side, which is in eclipse, a dark side, a dark near side. So we did a little bit of pre-processing using an in-house parser, parser and a little bit of interpolation. Uh, some data massaging. Uh, so we measured the moment of inertia first. So we've picked some data. We didn't intentionally slew the spacecraft to do this, but luckily there was some data that showed uh, some maneuvers in the, the Z axis, the X axis, and Y axis, which gives us a complete range of, observ of observability. So, and the bottom plots show the moment of inertia converging. Well, you can you might argue, why is it oscillating? That's because the solar rays are rotating. So as you can see, as you'll see later, however, I can subtract that out. So these are this is just the inertia of the solar rays, and I can subtract the values out and compare them with. Uh, the moment of inertia that we measured on ground before launch, which we only did for a certain uh, fill fractions of the fuel tank of the propellant. So uh, we, yes, so we started with 40%. Uh, and the converged value is slightly lower than that, indicating that we have a little less than 40% fuel left. It's pretty close. The off diagonal turns are nearly the same. So method works. And then we we look at the solar radiation pressure during eclipses. Yeah. There's no radiation pressure. Uh, lunar radiation pressure looks good, and we start off in the hot side. Uh, you see, there's a lot of there's a very large radiation pressure component. Then gravity gradient torque. Uh, these are high order gravity gradient torques. We actually get something that looks interesting. Uh, looks plausible, I think. We start out at start out around here, where there's a lot of gradient here. So this corresponds to this part. So I, I think it might be plausible. As you know, the gravity is gravity is very delicate to measure. So, but results seem not so off. The magnitude is pretty good. And one more thing, uh, we, we we got data, so we can uh, work out the gravity coefficients backward using a neural network. So these are spherical harmonics. Uh, you know this from they're arranged in the lower triangle way, and we can uh, estimate them using a neural network that's kind of arranged in the same way. It looks kind of similar. So we stack the. All right. So we stack, so we make the network shape kind of similar to how the spherical harmonics would be arranged. It's getting larger and larger as you get towards the end. And 
we input the position and the, the normal of the position and the gravity quark that we got from the beginning. And then what we get is the spherical harmonics out. So I don't know, it, it might be overfitting, probably, but it's an interesting way of doing it. So in conclusion, uh, we can get some very interesting results from looking at just the telemetry of KPL dynamic. Thank you very much. <laughs>